Hello friends, this is Mike Williams. Earlier this month, I had the pleasure of speaking with Vince Russo. This portion of the interview is an outtake from an upcoming show we did discussing the Beatles. Given the current state of affairs, I thought our 20-minute conversation would be of interest to my subscribers. So here's the outtake, and thanks for listening. Mike, I have to ask you this before we start, and it's going to be a little off topic, but I have to ask you this, and I'm going to ask you to try to answer it in a couple of paragraphs, which I know is impossible, but a lot of people knew I was going to interview you, and they wanted to get your thoughts on the coronavirus. And I've been reading um, some of your coverage, listening to some of the things that you are saying. Can you please give us your thoughts on what's currently going on? Okay, so I'll give you my my position or my opinion on this thing. People are obviously not going to agree. It's not real in the sense that it's not some killer virus. What they've done is they've taken the normal flu season and they've given it a name. And this has allowed them to play out the whole pandemic scenario that we're seeing today. One of the things that I did was to take a look at the numbers. So everything that the controlling apparatus does, everything is done by the numbers. So when this first came out, they first came out with coronavirus, and then that became COVID-19. So my first thought was, well, why did they change the nomenclature? Why did they change the name of the virus from coronavirus to COVID-19? So it turns out that coronavirus in numerology uh, equals the number 11, and COVID-19 in numerology is 9. So it's 9-11. 9-11, that number, September 11th, the date, and so on, is a very, very important number in the occult. And it represents moments in time when they can transform. It's when they can make drastic changes. If anybody remembers uh, Rahm Emanuel saying that you never let a good crisis go to waste, mm -hmm. this is what's happening. And it's also an indication for anybody who's really paying attention and wants to connect the dots that the whole concept of a worldwide government exists, right? So... They want everybody to believe that we have our own sovereign countries and this, this nationalism and so on. That doesn't exist because this is all being controlled at an international level. And we can see this just by the sheer fact that everything has a template. So what's happening here is happening in Europe. It's happening in Australia. It's happening in South America. It's happening everywhere. It's the same template. It's the same words. It's the same edicts, controls, and so on that are in place. So why are they doing it? And I've been asked this question. And again, this is my opinion. What the controllers do periodically is to run exercises. In fact, the Secretary of State, he came out a couple of weeks ago during a um, press conference. He called it an exercise. Very interesting words, right? He called it an exercise. I called it a drill going back a few weeks ago, which is the same thing as an exercise. And so what they're doing is they're testing how effective their network is in responding to tops down orders. So in other words, for, you have to first get your head wrapped around the fact that there is a shadow government. There is a deep state that this does exist. Okay. The president of the United States, the prime minister of, of England and the prime ministers and the presidents across the world, they are not where the buck stops. They have masters, they have bosses. And so they're testing to see how responsive their network is. And this includes their first responders, police, firemen, EMS, medical, media, obviously they have in their back pocket. This is why we're getting inundated 24 seven with coronavirus, COVID-19. And they wanna to test to see how quickly the governors, they can implement the plans that they need them to implement. How quickly can they rein everything in? How quickly can they get people to obey and be compliant and just follow the rules that have been laid out for them. And uh, so that's what I believe this is. There is no killer virus out there. The CDC's own numbers on any given year in the United States, 56,000 people die from flu-related illnesses on any given year. And in the United States, the coronavirus slash COVID-19 is nowhere near those numbers. 
In fact, I was reading this morning that the stock market surged another 1,100 points because they are seeing that the virus is uh, letting up in New York. My lady and I, just a few days ago, we were hearing all these stories about hospitals, the me mainstream media telling us that you know they're beyond capacity, they need ventilators, there's people coming in that are sick and so on. And then we, we have the alternative media saying the hospitals are quiet. There's no unusual activity. So about two weeks ago, uh, one of my family members, Vince and I spoke before we got on the show here, is ill. And he's, he's very ill. And um, so he had to be rushed to the hospital two weeks ago to a major hospital in the Raleigh area. And I'm talking about a very large hospital. So the EMS took him to the emergency room. And when I got there, Vince, it's an enormous waiting room in this ER, in this hospital in Raleigh. There was only three other people sitting in the emergency room aside from my family. There was five of us. So eight people total, us five and the three other people. This was in the midst of the coronavirus frenzy. You know, I'm sitting there and I'm thinking to myself, well, this doesn't look like a frenzy to me. This doesn't look like a bunch of people coming in that are really ill, coughing, hacking, sneezing, and so on. Nothing. So he was admitted. And the next day, you know, I came back. And uh, so I went to the main entrance this time, the lobby, to check in and sign in. And again, there was very little activity. And then when I went to go park the car in this particular hospital, parking sometimes, many times, can be a challenge because I've been there before. And the parking lot was wide open. So I said, this is something's not right with this. Uh, going back about three days ago, my lady and I went uh, on a ride. We got in our car and I said, let's take a look at some of the urgent cares in our neighborhood, the primary care that I go to in my neighborhood. And let's check out three hospitals, local hospitals. And we did. So when I got to the two urgent cares, there was nobody in them. The first one had nobody. The second one had two people sitting in the waiting area. And this, this particular urgent care is a combination primary care and urgent care. So they share the same waiting area. Between the two, there was two people. That's it. And so then we went to the um, to the hospitals. And we went to a hospital in uh, a town just outside of mine, a smaller hospital. It was crickets. Parking lot was empty. Then we went to two larger hospitals, one in Cary, North Carolina, and the other one in Raleigh, North Carolina. And again, very quiet, nothing. They had the tents at the two larger hospitals, but there was absolutely no activity. There was at the larger hospital, excuse me, at the second largest hospital, the one in Cary, the tents were up. There was like two or three of them. And there were three healthcare workers at a small table up close toward the building. One of them was, was standing up doing something and two others were at the table playing with their phones. No activity, none whatsoever. So to add on to this, yesterday I, I went to the urgent care and I got to talk to the nurse while I was waiting for the doctor to come in. And again, I go in there, it's a Sunday, it's like uh, three o'clock in the afternoon. Nobody in the in the waiting room. Nobody. I was the only one there. So I go back and so I'm talking to this to the nurse and I said, So you, are you seeing a lot of coronavirus? And he goes, Oh yeah. I said, You are? He says, Yeah. I said, Well, how are you determining it? He says, Well, we don't have test kits. So if somebody comes in and they say they have a cold or they have the symptoms like a fever and stuff like that, you know, flu symptoms, they're labeling it coronavirus. And this nurse told me they don't have any test kits. They have just been instructed that when somebody comes in with cold or flu symptoms, it's coronavirus. Gosh. All right. So, so what's happening is if somebody comes in and they have the cold or they have the flu, and that's how it's being labeled, they're obviously padding the numbers. So then I said, well, if somebody has coronavirus and you've diagnosed it, what do you do then? And um, they said to me, we send them home. I said, that's it? He goes, yeah, we send them home. We tell them to self-quarantine and just, you know, and get better. I said, well, that's the same thing you would do with the flu or, or the cold. You would go home and you would, you know, take the cold medication or the flu medication. Or some people don't take any of that stuff. They have home remedies and they just wait it out. And in mm -hmm. a week, you're up and you're on your feet again. And then I said to him, you know, I heard that there are these tents. And I was playing a little dumb because... I didn't want him. He didn't know who I was, you know, and I was being very 
nice to him because he was a really good guy. And right. uh, he was just offering this information to me, you know, and I said, well, what about the tents? I said, how does that work? He goes, I have no idea. He says, uh, when you get to go to these tents, he says, there is a, uh, a vetting process. There's a questionnaire you have to fill out. I said, you have to fill out a questionnaire before you can get tested at these tents? He goes, yeah. I said, well, that doesn't make any sense. It seems to me that these tents are set up to be the first line of defense, triage. When we went to the one hospital, that's how the tent was labeled. It had a big sign on it. It said triage. And then you have to go fill out this form. He said, yeah, it doesn't make any sense. He goes, I, I, I just hope this doesn't last in you know, very long. And I said, well, what are you being told inside of your own medical facility, which is very large, by the way. It's a very large medical network within North Carolina. And so what I was asking was, are you getting any direction tops down about where this is going? How long do you think you're going to have to be on alert and doing all this stuff? And he says, we're getting no information whatsoever. He goes, other than what's on TV. I said, you're not getting any information from within your own internal organization. You have to rely on the television set. He goes, yeah. He says, I'm telling you, Mr. Williams, it's a lot of people, he said, that are very, very scared. I said, of course, they're very, very scared. I said, because the stuff is running on the television 24-7, seven days a week. Everything is coronavirus and COVID-19. In fact, when we went to the emergency room two weeks ago, Vince, we get in there. They had the TV sets, you know, all of them in the ER are putting this fearful stuff, pumping it into the emergency room. While people are sitting there because they have loved ones that had to be rushed to the hospital, it was an environment that was so surreal and beyond any level of decency, in my opinion. My family, actually my sister got up and went to the person at the desk and said, could you do us a favor and change that channel and put something on that it's not all this fear porn. Yeah. And so they did, they changed the channel. But you know, this is, this is very, very strange. And so, you know, why the exercise and why the drill? I mentioned in one video I had on my main channel, I don't have a crystal ball. But anytime they do stuff like this, it's in preparation for something else in the future, right? So, so, so they need to test the system to make sure that when they have to deploy the system, that it'll work properly. It'll respond correctly. And one of the things that they've done is they don't want to put troops in the street. They don't want to have police in the street. They don't want to do that stuff. They don't want the papers, please perception, right? Mm -hmm. So what they've done is they, they've indoctrinated people to browbeat each other into compliance. So if you happen to be outside, you want to walk your dog, your neighbors are kind of looking at you with the evil eye and you, know, you shouldn't be out. You shouldn't be doing this. You should be inside. You're going to kill people. You're going to affect you know, the health of others. This is a tactic that the deep state uses all the time, which is they actually use the population itself to actually force compliance, peer pressure, as an example. It's just unbelievable. I mean, we were walking on a trail. Our trail here where we live, is it's a big lake. It's nice. It's very pretty. And uh, most people are just, you know, a level-headed and are just going for a walk with their their spouse or their partner or their kids. And uh, But you do have the – I had one guy the other day. Uh, my lady and I were walking and uh, we were talking. This, this guy's coming toward us. This guy actually veered off – and walked into the woods around us. And, and you know, we, we, we let him go. And we just, we started, I started chuckling. And, and so she said to Barry, said to me, she says, so <laughs> you caught that mic? I'm like, how can I not? He's in there with the squirrels now, you know? So, <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it's just unbelievable, Vince. And, you know, and when you question it, and, you know, it's legitimate to question things. But they've gotten people to the point where even if you question it, even if you ask reasonable questions, you are deemed a, a nut job, a conspiracy yeah. theorist. You know, you shouldn't be questioning. Just follow direction. Listen to the authorities. Now in North Carolina, and I was told this is already in place in other uh, states in the United States, basically you're going to have to go take a number to go shopping because they only want so many people in this store per square foot. Yeah, they just did that in a Walmart here today. Just did it. Five people every 1,000 square feet. Yeah, with signs all over the place. Social distancing, social distancing. This is this is conditioning, folks. It's conditioning. It's to get you thinking in terms of separating yourself from, from your neighbor, from your family. It, it's just, 
it, it's just an unbelievable psychological operation. And what's really disheartening to me is how many people just just fold their cards, fall in line, and don't question anything. Yeah, you know, it's it's very disheartening because I'm telling you, you they're taking away our rights, and uh, and people are just allowing it to happen. You know, Mike, when we when we get into, you know, talking about, you know, McCartney and, and Rubber Soul and all that, you know, you know, I learned through you and I, I learned, you know, through reading, you know, you Harriet. I did not know this before, but you know, when you talk about Illuminati, yeah, they put it out there right in front of your face because that that that's part of it, that's part of the system, because nobody's going to believe it. Right. And the thing that blew me away that, you know, a couple of my friends that a conspiracy theor theorist, uh, you know, put me on to was that um, that a conference, that 201 conference yeah. that took place October 31st. You can go online and you can see highlights from this conference, which was a um, which, which was a preparation. Right. The end of October for exactly what is happening now. Right. How can nobody be talking about that? Because people do not pay attention to alternative news. Uh, you know, a very small percentage of people do. So many people, Vince, are glued to the television set and the cable news and the network news. Basically, um, it's the Ministry of Propaganda and People just soak it up and they believe what they're getting is the truth. You're not getting the truth. You're not getting the truth. You're, you're getting fed an agenda and they're indoctrinating you and conditioning you to, to follow whatever it is that they're putting out there and to be obedient and compliant. That's the one thing, Mike, I think more than anything else I'm concerned about. And the one thing I'm concerned about is going forward, are they going to take out this card every single time they want to control the public? Yeah. I mean, I think what this has shown is uh, it has shown that their ability to have the vast majority of people to fall in line and walk single file, it's done. It's cooked. Yeah, you know, The people that question it, they're the outliers, right? So they're few and far between. So I, I do believe that they run these these tests every once in a while. They, they, they float these things out there because they do want to see how indoctrinated and conditioned people are. Because to the degree that they think that they have an overwhelming critical mass of people that will just follow, that allows them to now take the next step in whatever that transformation is to change the society and change the culture. That's what they're doing. You know, but unfortunately, as we've discussed, most people, they are completely unaware of this. If you talk to people about the deep state, if you talk to them about shadow government, if you talk to them about the pyramid of power, the Illuminati, they don't have a clue what you're talking about. And if they do have some semblance of an idea, the first thing they think is you're a nut job. You're a conspiracy theorist. You have a tinfoil hat and this stuff doesn't really exist. Yet, as I've shown with the last presentation, on the Beatles music, it's all hidden in plain sight. Mm -hmm. If you look, it is there. They are telling you, but you have to have eyes to see and ears to hear. If you don't, then you're just going to be in the matrix. You know, it's like the movie, the matrix. You want the red pill or the blue pill. Red pill is reality. Blue pill is the imaginary illusionary world. Most people are taking the blue pill. Let me ask you this one last question. As far as the situation right now, what what would your guess be on the end game? What 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 do you think the end game is with what we're uh, experiencing right now? That's that's a good question. Uh, one of the things is that um, they really do want to damage the economy to the degree where they're going to uh, bring forth the one world currency. This is mm -hmm. something that they have been planning for a very long time. Yeah. But because people are so attached to the whole nationalistic viewpoint, like, you know, the US dollar and so on, that people would be re reluctant to, you know, to give that up. But I think what they're going to say is that, see, now we had a worldwide event where all of the countries had to come together. It's something that affected everybody. 
It just didn't affect the people in the United States or the people in the UK. It was everybody. So we have to have more commonality. We have to tie it together. So I think that what they're going to say is one of those starts is going to be a one world currency. And that one world currency is clearly going to be digital. Uh, they don't want real money out there. They don't want to, they don't want a black market. They want to be able to account for everything because, you know, they, they do want to tax everything. That's the whole thing. You know, taxation is, is slavery. You're a debt slave because you're the one that's going to work. You're the one earning the money, not them. And then they steal 30 to 40 percent of every dollar that people make under the guise that we need to do this because if we don't, we can't build roads. We can't do this. It's all nonsense. Because if the government were al not allowed, but if the government actually in the United States actually adhered to the Constitution, the Treasury would coin its own money and there would be no debt. Because if you create your own money, you can't have debt. You created it. You mm -hmm. can't owe yourself money. Right. Right. So if the Treasury prints its own money on behalf of the U.S. government and instead of saying Federal Reserve notes on top of the pieces of paper that you carry around your pocket and it said U.S. government notes, it would be a whole different story. The other thing that I think that they want to push is the whole vaccine program. They really want to step that up. Uh, the anti-vaccination segment of society has gotten a lot of traction because they've been asking a lot of questions, legitimate questions, in my view. And they don't want even legitimate questions asked about vaccines, even though there are whistleblowers that have stepped forward and have said that these pharmaceutical companies are well aware that the vaccines are tied to other illnesses. But they don't want to have that discussion. And uh, so what's going to happen now is that's going to be this gigantic, you know, it's going to start off as a snowball at the top of the mountain. And now it's going to be a, a, a landslide by the time it hits the base of the mountain. And they're looking just to plow over anybody that's going to ask questions about vaccinations. Yeah. Wow. You know, so those are two things off the top of my mind, you know, that I think that could be the results of all this. You know, the censorship that took place on, Social media, it's still in place. You know, I've, I personally have had shows yanked. Shows were up for four or five years on YouTube talking about various topics. And my, when, you know, when I have my shows, I'm not combative or mm -hmm. some kind of lunatic shouting into a microphone. My guests are very intelligent people who are well researched on their topics, and we're having a very adult conversation, a very intellectual conversation about something. But they don't want that. They don't want voices of reason. They don't want intelligent conversation because that might start to get people to wake up a little bit and pay attention. So what do they do? They shoot those shows and they take them out. Yeah. You know, and then we say, okay, we'll put it on BitChute. That's great. I have my BitChute channel, but let's face it. YouTube is the king of video for social media. Yeah. The other ones pale in comparison. So they're trying to pigeonhole us and paint us into a corner. And so we have to figure out other ways to be able to get the word out. Mm -hmm.